I want to introduce myself really briefly. My name is Kate Tuttle, and I'm a book critic and essayist. I'm president of the National Book Critics Circle. And I'm really delighted to be here talking with three extraordinary writers uh, about minor characters, the wives, the maids, the uh, forgotten. <laughs> um, to, immediately to my left is Valerie Martin. Emily Wilson is to her left, and Margaret Atwood on the far end. And I wanted to invite uh, Margaret Atwood to begin with a little incantation, a little uh, jump rope rhyme from her wonderful book, The Penelope Ad. <laughs> right, The Penelope Ad is uh, uh, the story you know so well, but told, told from the point of view of Penelope and the 12 maids that got hanged at the end of the Odyssey. And Penelope is the main narrator, but the maids act as a chorus. And uh, each of the choral numbers that they do is in a different poetic form. And the first one that they do, because they certainly hold it against everyone that they got hanged, they're quite <laughs> vengeful. Uh, the, the first one is called the chorus line a rope jumping rhyme. And they're addressing Penelope. They keep drifting into her view, and whenever she wants to talk to them, they, they fly away. We are the maids, the ones you killed, the ones you failed. We danced in air, our bare feet twitched. It was not fair. With every goddess, queen, and bitch, from there to here, you scratched your itch. And Odysseus being the one addressed there. <laughs> we did much less than what you did. You judged us bad. You had the spear, you had the word. At your command, we scrubbed the blood of our dead paramours from floors, from chairs, from stairs, from doors. We knelt in water while you stared at our bare feet. It was not fair. You licked our fear. It gave you pleasure. You raised your hand. You watched us fall. We danced on air. The ones you failed. The ones you killed. I am skipping. So, yes. <laughs> so, when so, they that, do. so that's an amazing. <laughs> And it occurs to me that that is um, giving voice to some characters who may be considered minor characters in the greater story of the Odyssey. Uh, which leads me to my first question, which is really what makes a minor character minor? Any thoughts? They're, they're not major. <laughs> <laughs> but somebody chose to make them not major. What are the characteristics? of a minor character, and why should we pay attention to them? OK, so I think it varies from work to work, obviously, but the kind of minor character you're talking about are ones who are minor but are nonetheless instrumental uh, in the plot. So that's true of the maid slaves in the Odyssey, uh, and it's true of the maid slaves in the story of Rachel and Leah. Mm. In Genesis, they, they never get to say anything, but without them, there would not be 12 tribes of Israel. And your point was um, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, yeah. they're, they're pivotal to the plot of Hamlet. Yeah, we were talking about that um, the other day. That our, That's a play I really admire, and I think about um, the, the brilliance of Stoppard to have been looking at the play and thought about who Rosencrantz and Guildenstern really are and why they're there. And in my mind, there is they, there is a, a moment in the play when everything changes, and that's when Hamlet says to Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, or Guildenstern and Rosencrantz, um, <laughs> "Were you sent for?" And they don't answer right away. Right. And then they do. They say they were sent for. At that moment, they become double agents. Right. Um, Hamlet no longer trusts them. Everything in the play changes, and it's just because of the pause in that answer to the question, mm -hmm. were you sent for it? I thought that was so... It's really deep, isn't it? Because sometimes those minor characters, so-called, um, 
are pivotal because they are double agents, because right. they do know more. Uh, because if you're in a position of less power, you know what's happening. Um, well, as you said earlier, Margaret, both upstairs and downstairs. You know, it's the downstairs world that knows what the upstairs is doing. The upstairs world has no clue. Um, and yeah, and what makes that case so, so touching is that here are these guys who are caught inside a play. And there's a play going on inside the play. Right, right, of course, right. So it just starts kind of refracting and refracting, and, and then the characters are murdered. Yeah. The minor characters. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's a, that's a wonderful moment. How much? <laughs> <laughs> Moments of death are often when minor characters yeah. really come to the forefront. <laughs> um, <laughs> How did you think about the minor characters in the Odyssey, Emily, when you were working on translation? What did you do to, to really try to get, make them rounded, as, you, as you've mentioned? Well, I guess, I mean, bef I, before even getting to that, I feel like we should talk about how there's a difference between um, what it means to be a minor character in terms of power within the story versus what does it mean in terms of how much airtime do you get? Mm. I mean, in the Odyssey, Athena, in some ways, is the most powerful character. But she doesn't speak as much as Odysseus does because he's con we have so much of the poem that's through his voice, with his voice telling the story. Um, so is she more major than him or is he more major than her? And I think one of the major things that I wanted to do as a translator of the Odyssey was just to show how, how interestingly fluid the point of view of the poem is, how much we actually get much more access than I think some readers, some translators have thought hmm. to the point of view even of the hanged slave women. And, let alone the point of view of the goddess Calypso or the point of view of the always veiled Penelope whose mind is also veiled and yet she's also a fully alive character. I wanted to just show that even when we don't get lots and lots of lines from their voice, they're still fully alive. Yeah, and so Penelope comes fully alive, of course, in your work, Margaret. What made you decide to, to center your sort of retelling of the Odyssey on, on Penelope? Well, it always annoyed me. Um, I mean, I think things that annoy you when you're 16 kind of stay with you. Mm. And uh, it, it, it annoyed me that she spent so much time crying uh, and offering sacrifices and having um, dreams. But somebody must have been running the place. Right. So it wasn't Telemachus. He's too young. It wasn't the suitors, and it wasn't the dad of Odysseus, because he was over on the other side of the island fooling around amongst the pear trees. Um, so who, who must have been running things? It must have been her, but she's never shown doing it. So, mm -hmm. so there's that. Uh, the other interesting thing about her, which you, you bring out too, she's very smart. Yeah. Uh, and uh, she also is a noteworthy liar in her own right. So we're told about what a great liar Odysseus is, and we see him doing it, and sometimes he overreaches himself uh, with it. But, uh, but she also is a great deceiver. Uh, she's got this web thing going. <laughs> she's got the, she has. The yes. web caper. Uh, the shroud caper is, is what she's doing, uh, and lying about it all the time. So my, one of my questions was, when the two of them get together at the end, uh, and start telling each other what they've been doing for the last 20, 20 years. years. Yeah. Are they telling the truth? <laughs> right. <laughs> Are they telling the truth? Yeah. So there was that, but, but the thing that really annoyed me when I was 16 was these maids mm -hmm. getting hanged. Yes. Because if you look, go back through the text and look at it quite carefully, um, they didn't seem to have chosen initially to have been um, sleeping with the suitors. Mm -hmm. uh, they seem to have made that decision that you can read about in, in, women, in, in a woman in Berlin, in which you have a choice of sleeping with one person or getting raped by everybody. Which would you do, gentle reader? Mm -hmm. uh, and, <laughs> and, and, and then they get blamed for it. So I think you mentioned this yourself, that it, it's not even uh, you are being punished for bad things you did. It's you have to be wiped out mm -hmm. because you're, you're dirty. Yep. You're dirtified. You have dirtified my house, whether it's your fault or not. So it's a lot more like honor killings. You know, you're, you're just dirty. Mm -hmm. You've you, got to clean up the dirt, and then you have to be obliterated. 
And some of the choruses that the maids um, give us talk about how we are, we're garbage, we're disposable, we're... That, and, that's and, how they're and treated. Then Penelope yeah. doesn't trust them. She doesn't trust any maids. Mm -hmm. um, so they really are um, sort of exiles, and, and they're conscious of it, and they resent it. Mm -hmm. as, as you would... As a human being, as, as, yes. as maids do, yeah. as, as slaves do. <laughs> yes, and let, let's hear about your maid. Yes, yes. Oh, well, point. my maid actually um, loves being a maid and um, <laughs> is, feels that the, the best thing that ever happened to her was getting a job working for Dr. Jekyll. Um, <laughs> <laughs> little, little did she know, <laughs> right? And that she's finally safe because she's 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 had a, a rough time. So, um, and she's a good girl, and she's a, a good girl right to the end. So she's very different from your mm -hmm. conniving little maids who wind up strung up. Mm -hmm. Well, not because they were conniving. Whereas, just... where, whereas my girl s survives, yes. and her goodness <laughs> is, <laughs> is <laughs> unquestioned. Uh, our maids sneer upon your maid. <laughs> And, and we've got more of them. <laughs> that's, that's true. true. That's true. <laughs> I think it's interesting how in the Odyssey there's this very clear distinction between the two types of slave, which is related to the two types of mate. Mm -hmm. There's the, the quote-unquote bad slaves who are represented by Melantho, um, the male one, who's the wrong, the evil limb who's owned by the wrong owners, performing the wrong kind of work, serving the wrong male masters. And then uh, and Melantho, the black flower, Melantheus, the black, male black flower. So and that's the only speaking part among the 12, ma 12 ser servant or sla slave women is Melantho, whom Penelope, of course, has brought up like a daughter. So she mm. has issues with her kids in both, both with Telemachus and with um, the teenage daughter. And then we have the quote-unquote good servants, who are the ones whose interests are, they imagine themselves happiest when they're being enslaved, mm -hmm. that you, both Eumaeus and Eurycleia totally identify their own interests with those of their owners, don't even want to go back to their biological families, even if they had them. They love being owned Mate. and enslaved. And that whole horrible fantasy, I think, is... Singing in the cotton field. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That was, not, that was not, you know, coming from their point of view. That was yes. a, an, an, an imaginative... Um... It's not out of the question. Yep. It's something that can happen. People can get so messed up in like their minds by, the, by that kind of position. Well, I think there can actually also be close relationships between, between uh, masters and, and yes. servants. I mean, and that's one of the... That's one of the reasons they, there's so many books in which there, there are maids and servants mm -hmm. and butlers and um, I'm Who? thinking of Jeeves, right? That, you know, <laughs> he, yeah. he, he can't do without his yes. butler and, yes. his, and his butler is perfectly aware of that. Um, so all kinds of possible relationships occur, but it, all, it really depends on who's telling the story because the master will always see the servant differently than the servant sees the master. There, it's not love. Right, exactly. There's no equality, but there can be um, a, sort of a, an apprehension of the other entity and, you know, your value and, to them and his, like, my value to my servant and my servant's value to me. Mm -hmm. Well, exactly, and you were, um, you were mentioning in, in both, uh, well, in Wide Sargasso Sea, Jean Rees does something yeah. similar to that where she shifts the terms of the story um, you know, from what had been the main story to another side. Mm -hmm. um, are there other examples of that that you can think of that, that you sort of play in your mind when, when you were thinking about Mary Riley? Um, I, I, the certainly why Sargasso Sea was, was one. I think that was, um, I, I probably read that when I was pretty young. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and then there was the Rosencrantz and Gilderstern. Um, I, can't, I can't think of any others in particular, but I've always been very interested in the whole idea of maids and ultimately of slavery, which is why I wrote a book about a slave-owning woman mm -hmm. who's not nice at all. She's no. a bad girl. But, um, but for this one, um, the maid is, actually, the maid is based on a, on a, a true um, character. When I started to write this book, I wanted to find out what 19th century maids in Britain were like, so I went to the British Museum, and I tried to get a library card, and. Um, see if I could look for manuscripts of diaries. And I had to be interviewed in order to do this by a very fusty and superior seeming person who said, she, she quizzed me about what I was doing, why I would think that they might have them, maybe I should try the registry offices 
Uh, and she said, finally, I just don't think you're going to find anything because they were all illiterate, don't you see? Um, and I thought, hmm. Yeah. So then I went back to Vassar Library <laughs> and uh, found, this was before computers, and did, in fact, find several books about um, and diaries of 19th century maids. And one was a woman named Hannah Culwick, who was the maid of a lawyer whose name was Arthur Munby. And um, she was very devoted to him. She never wanted to be a lady. She always wanted to be a maid. He took a lot of photographs of her. He liked to have her dress up uh, as a slave and put black um, boot blacking on her, on her really? face. And oh my god. Oh. She literally licked his boots clean. Um, it was quite a relationship, but one of the things he did. <laughs> wow, that is, is extraordinary. Oh, it's, I came across this book on, a, on a, sh a table in my little town. It was as if it was just handed to me. Yeah. Because um, there was a lot of photographs in it as well. He, he did a lot of photographs of her and of other. He liked to see working women. He liked to see coal mining women. He would go to the coal mines and photograph them when they came out. It sounds like an evil guy, but yeah. He did require her to keep a diary. And she wrote in a very interesting um, sort of, she was writing for him, so in some sense it was possibly not genuine. But then ultimately um, he married her. Wow. And, um, That's a plot twist I didn't see coming. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and a lot of the diary, he tried to get her to marry him for years and she would not because she said she did not want to be a lady. She wanted to remain, she thought the relationship was good the way it was. Um, but ultimately she gave in because he, he was ill and he wanted to provide for her, wow. um, which he did. And so she wound up buried next to him. It was great, it's, it's a great story. But that, that's where my notion of this maid who actually really sees her employment um, as the saving of her. Right. Even though it requires her to be constantly sort of degraded and, um, at, you know, at beck and call. That's a, it's such a disturbing concept, you know, um, that kind of double um, thing. And it, it makes me think a little bit of the position of some of the wives um, in The Handmaid's Tale. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> you know, there's this idea that you, you're rescued maybe from a worse fate, but you're in a pretty bad mm -hmm. position. And I, I've always wondered, and now I have you here and can ask, what was going through your mind when you, uh, when you laid out the terms of the different positions a woman could inhabit in Gilead? Just, just, just go back in Western civilizations <laughs> about 150 years, um, if that. Yeah. So when did women get the right, when did married women get the right to have their own bank accounts without their husband's approval? That was sometime in the 50s. You, you don't have to go back very yeah, far. That's true. Uh, all of this, the things we take for granted uh, today, and possibly we're taking them less for granted because those foundations are feeling a bit shaky, uh, you do not have to go back very far in time mm. uh, to find a time when married women could not um, uh, make financial decisions by themselves, when they did not have the right to their children, if there was a divorce. Uh, all of these things have changed quite recently. Uh, so not far back in time and in other parts of the world, those things are, are still in place. Uh, so this is not a, we, we may be living in a little bubble of time here. Yeah. <laughs> However, just to cheer you up, <laughs> <laughs> if, you, if you go back beyond the early Bronze Age, if, if you go back to the world of, of hunter-gatherers, things were a lot more equal. There was more interpersonal violence because there was no architecture. Hmm. Think about it. So you want to settle scores. You actually couldn't put somebody in a dungeon. You couldn't put them in jail because there weren't any, <laughs> there weren't right. any jails. So. You just have to like hit them with a rock or something. Uh, yeah. Uh, or to quote uh, Jeannie, a person from the far Canadian north who said, I grew up on the land uh, and a man in, in our community went crazy and said he was going to kill all of us. And I said, Jeannie, what did you do? And she said, well, 
there were no police, there were no mental institutions, there were no prisons. My dad took care of it <laughs> and stop. And I, I think a lot of things were like that before, guess what? Athena decides we're going to have a jury of That's right, yes. <laughs> count the 12, count them 12 men. Exactly, the beginning and of the, patriarchy in the old yes, style. The, if only right, we could right. get 12 men in here. There are 12, yes. you know, the magic number 12. Yes. Uh, and the humanities are going to have a little grotto somewhere and they can still have some flowers and things, but they're, we're no longer going to have blood feuds. Mm -hmm. And uh, the killing of a mother is no longer going to be the great Ur crime, which, which is uh, the most feared and horrible thing that you could do. Mm -hmm. So that's in the Oresteia, early Bronze Age architecture comes in, there will be a grotto. <laughs> <laughs> so you speak against architecture? I'm not speaking against it. I'm just pointing out that you, you can't imprison people if you don't have a prison. Mm -hmm. You can't have housekeepers I mean, and maids if you don't have a house. You got it. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, there you, and go. you can't have. I mean, a, do we really have to go back a, and, and live among trees? You can tie people to trees. Yes. Oh, they just kill them. I mean, you don't want to waste the rope. No. Uh, <laughs> tying them to a tree. Silly girl. Um, so, yeah. So, so, so back, back beyond. You have. Uh, more equal I think blaming the power. building for the fact that people. Um, I'm, I'm not blaming the building. I'm just <laughs> saying that it's a precondition. <laughs> if you want to imprison somebody, you have to have a prison. Right. No. 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 <laughs> no. This is fascinating. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> but, it, but in a tree. You know? Yeah. No. I. Well, it is interesting because it, 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 it does get back to this idea that I think you mentioned in the introduction to your translation of the Odyssey, Emily, where you talk about um, an, an imagined uh, matriarchal past and whether it was real or whether it was imagined or whether, it was, or whether that idea of a matriarchal past was even uh, just a, a figment of male I think fear. it's a male fantasy. I mean, I think the, all, the whole of... It's their nightmare. It's their nightmare. It is their nightmare. nightmare. Fantasy. Yes, exactly, yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe we should also get back to the issues about, about power and what happens when the wrong people seize power and how is that imagined by the exactly. dominant narrative. I mean, I was thinking about how this is partly about gender and, of course, it's partly about trying to keep women down but also about keeping lower classes down and how, in a way, the plot of the Odyssey hinges on both the restoration of the heteronormative marriage but then also on um, what happens when the people who are supposed to be doing all the rowing and their function is to be conveying the elite man from one place to another. Right. What if they try to have a heroic death or have some say in what's going to happen? They're going to eat the cattle of the sun, it's going to be bad news. Right. So, so it, can, it can apply to, to class as well as gender. Well, that's right. So the, other, so the other minor characters in the Odyssey, it's not just the, the uh, slaves in the house and it's not just you know, women and children, but it's also the men, the sailors, the people who are, are meant to be helping Odysseus, and they end up meeting a terrible end. Mm -hmm. um, I am curious about that turn, though, where you where you try to get into a minor character's head, or you try to um, you try to give them their point of view, give them their place in the sun. I mean, it doesn't always require writing a whole book about it, mm -hmm. but but how do you do it in a book where the minor characters remain minor, but mm -hmm. they but how do you make them come alive and be important? I mean, sometimes you can just leave them as sticks, you know. Yeah. Or they or they can be you know really archetypes, or they can just be. Um, placeholders. Hmm. Mm -hmm. That would not be good, but you can do that. <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah. I mean, for me, it, it was very important just to to call the slaves slaves rather than call them servants, because of course, if you within a modern within modern English, if you call um, Odysseus' slaves servants, then part of what you're doing is suggesting he's not an evil slave owner. It's fine. Right, um, right. <laughs> so well, also, if, if they didn't a, like it, they could quit. They can quit. They Whereas can just go home. And they can he's a job creator. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <John. laughs> yeah. Exactly, yes. <laughs> and in fact, I've read this, I, I recently read the Spark Notes on the Odyssey, which has, a, um, it has a t absolutely horrifying, and this is what the, the ninth graders are reading instead of the actual Odyssey. They're reading the Spark Notes, and the Spark Notes say, the disobedient servant women have to be executed. Have to be. Have, they have to have be. To they, be. And executed, I think, is also a really interesting and choice disobedient. of words. And they're disobedient and yeah. they're servant women. Every word, so every word there is like questionable, really right? Problematic. It shows you that even if you only have six words, you can frame it in a way that's false or not so false. 
wow. about how, like, to what degree do we allow the, the humanity and rights of these abused and murdered people to be present in the text or to be denied. Mm -hmm. I feel like you were even, about even executed rather than murdered. Exactly, yes. Exactly, yes. yeah. Well, so the yes. violence that, that, that takes place against, you know, by people in power in a narrative, against people out of power, it depends a lot on, 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 on seeing them as minor characters, on, 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 on the power mm -hmm. structure, seeing them as unimportant, mm -hmm. or as, as you were pointing out, Valerie, on assuming they're illiterate. Yeah. Because if somebody's mm -hmm. illiterate, if somebody's without a voice, that's very convenient. Mm -hmm. um, we won't, the, be, we won't be hearing from them. Exactly. In the future. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's true. The, the whole, it's, you know, when, in making characters, you, one will have more power than another. And I think about power a lot. Um, and it seems that if you have two people, whether they actually have architecture or not, <laughs> one, of them, <laughs> one of them is going to want power over the other. Mm -hmm. Right. It's I, just I, part I, of I, human I nature. I dispute that. Hmm? I think it depends what kind of culture you're living in. So some t cultures go out of their way to make sure that people are considered equal. Yeah, I gather Norwegians are like that. Mm. I, I don't know no, about the Norwegian. They don't, they don't like to create power relationships it's, and families and things. Mm. Yeah, I was, I was thinking more of, you know, Sam Bushman. Uh, who oh, will, no architecture. <laughs> they have no architecture, exactly. <laughs> or they didn't have at, at uh, that time. So, so it's actually, um, if, if you have to live in a group and everyone has to cooperate uh, equally, it's bad for somebody to assume a position where they think they're more powerful and better right. than other people. And they will, they, will, they will pull you down so that you're still on an equal level. Right. Mm. My own experience, of, I haven't had a lot of power in life. Um, but I. Oh, didn't. you've been at a university for too long. Well, that's what. That's, <laughs> that's what I was. That's, that's exactly where I'm going. But, you know, I, did, I did raise a child. I had a lot of power there. But I briefly was made an administer. Were you? I never a, heard of administrator. That. Administrator. I guess that's what you call them. Was that? It is. I was briefly the head of the MFA program, and it, it immediately corrupted me and completely. Really. I, <laughs> I, I would only do it for one semester because I realized this, almost as soon as the power was given to me, I just went crazy. And, <laughs> you know, student, students I liked got good things, and students I didn't like, their lives were made hell. <laughs> was, did was, did yeah. you uh, execute anyone? I didn't. No, no. I didn't, but you know, I got out of it as soon as I could. It's the same thing when the first time I bought a house, I realized I don't want anybody walking on my property. Mm -hmm. Who is that person? You so, became like the man. Huh? You became the man, like yeah. the, you know, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I'm stalking the. You know, right. Where right. is the boundary here? <laughs> uh, I want a fence. <laughs> so, you know, everybody has different reactions to getting into a position of power. It's very hard not to have, you know, even if you believe that it's a very bad thing for anyone to have power, it's still going to crop up, even among people who don't have architecture, mm -hmm. and. Yeah, the people who don't have architecture take steps, whereas nobody suppressed you. You want to have been suppressed while you were doing I this. I had to suppress college. myself. <laughs> so this is not for you. <laughs> well, power is really relative, right? I mean, you know, everybody has a certain position, um, you know, of sort of power, more power or less power, but along different axes in yeah. one's life. And you some know. people really want it. And some people want it more than others. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, it occurs to me, though, that all of you have power as writers and mm -hmm. authors. I, I think that's influence rather than power, mm -hmm. and I think there is a difference. Oh, that's a, no, I, I mean that's power over your fictional characters. Oh, yeah. The and power yes. over the words on oh, the yeah. page. Total. We've yeah. got total control. It's See, megalo you like that. megalomania. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I can see your li eyes light up from yes, here. But it's, it's very different if you're writing a film script. That is the least powerful right. position. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. my, my power as a translator is constantly limited by the other yes, text. Exactly. I'm constantly yes. having to, I'm always having to think about what does it say in the original. I, I, I don't have not, have very second strike power, which I kind of like. Well, well, you could probably lie, but omissions. people would catch you out. Other translators would would uh, rise up against you if you lied too much. And I don't want to lie too much. I mean, I actually want to tell the truth, and it's so hard to tell the truth. I'm trying to tell the truth all the time. Translators are actually yes. slaves. Yes, but they're also, <laughs> they are, yes, they are. 
But they are also Odysseus, right? I mean, they were constantly also making up words and making up yeah. being in disguise. My words are also Homer's words, so I'm constantly putting on a different disguise right. with every new author that I'm pretending to be. No. It's actually me all the time. It's like a ventriloquist. Where is that? Yes. Aren't, you, aren't, aren't you ever tempted to take control and do something entirely under your control? I am, yes. I'm very tempted, but I, I don't feel ready to publish anything like that. But yes, I'm tempted. Yes. Yes. So one day. Uh, <laughs> Not ready yet. Wait yes. for it, world. <laughs> yes. This is fascinating. I'm wondering what you, th what you all think the relationship is between lying and power. Mm -hmm. Oh. Yes. <laughs> That's a loaded question <laughs> in today's world. Yes. Uh, well, um, you have a lot of license. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But um, if you lie really to such an extraordinary degree, uh, you reach a state at which nobody believes anything you say. Mm -hmm. uh, but you can also create a state in which nobody believes anything that anybody says. That's mm -hmm. right. That's what we've got going yes. on. Yeah. So, seems to be our current These situation. Days. Yeah. yeah. Well, this might be a good time to open it up to questions. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure people have, have ideas out there. It's a little bit earlier than I thought, but I think this is good. Yeah, that's good. It's perfect. Um, so raise your hand, and somebody will come close up to you with a microphone. Please stand to ask the question. This is from Margaret Atwood. Mm -hmm. I'm a big fan, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering, you mentioned a minute ago that you have very, very little power when script writing. Mm -hmm. How much did you contribute to the writing of the recent TV series? And then when you're finished talking about that, could you talk a little bit about your sequel? OK. Um, I'm something called an executive consultant. That, that means nothing. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, the original television rights went with the um, contract to the 1989 film. And then, and then the ring of power was lost. <laughs> and, and it disappeared with this person called Gollum into the mountain. And uh, nobody actually knew who had the rights because the uh, the film was sold to a distributor. The distributor went bankrupt. The rights were dispersed, and the uh, and and nobody knew who actually had that contract. So for years we got asked, "Can we do a television thing of The Handmaid's Tale?" And we had to say, "We don't know who has the rights." But then a clever hobbit <laughs> called Frodo <laughs> went into the mountain and came out with the contract. And where should it have been all this time? but in a drawer somewhere at MGM. And so they discovered, <laughs> they discovered that much to their surprise, they had it. <laughs> and, uh, then there was an early attempt uh, at a script which happily did not get made. I did not write that script, but I wrote notes all over it saying things like, no, a female guerrilla fighter with her machine gun would not go into battle without her top one. Uh, <laughs> Personal choice, <laughs> personal choice, uh, and things like that. And I said, why does this person not have a top on? And they said, well, it's HBO. Um, <laughs> anyway, that didn't happen. Uh, and instead, it went to uh, Hulu, who, um, who threw every, every gambling chip they had onto the roulette wheel and spun the wheel. And they did assemble a very good team. And the, the showrunner, his name is, do you know what a showrunner, does anybody not know what a showrunner is? Basically, they're in charge of everything. Um, he uh, had decided when he was 19, he read this book uh, then, and decided that when he grew up, he was going to make a, a film out of it in some way. And he waited for it to come up. And when it emerged out of the mountain in the hands of Frodo, he, he noted that and pitched himself, and he knew that he worked so well that he got the job, and he introduces himself by saying, hi, I'm Bruce Miller, I'm the showrunner of The Handmaid's Tale, and I've got one penis too many. But I, 
but I hired a bunch of women, and he did. He hired the female director who had never directed a feature film before, only music videos, and she did a wonderful job. Uh, and many other, Elizabeth Moss is an executive producer, and the team is very devoted. So I have no power. I have a bit of influence in that if I really hate something, I can probably um, yell at people over the phone, and they, they might listen, but they don't have to. They don't have to. It's not contractually true that they have to listen to anything I say. Uh, so we're now going into, we're now actually shooting season three, and they're in uh, terra incognita mm -hmm. because they did the book in the first series. They're drawing on the, on the um, historical notes, and they're, they're holding to the uh, rule number one, which that nothing goes in that hasn't happened somewhere in human history. You, you can't just make shit up. Mm -hmm. um, so they're, they're respecting that. Uh, but as for me, controlling anything, don't be silly. Uh, mm -hmm. Authors of books are, are notoriously not listened to in Hollywood, and, and script writers, although they may provide the skeleton of something, a lot of other people then and come in and have a say um, about what lines they would prefer to be speaking, and they don't have enough air time, and they want more of this and less of that. Um, they don't like the shoes. Uh, there are a lot of people involved in making a, a film, everything from the costume designer to the music people to the people who do the color in fill after they've actually shot it. Uh, it's just a huge enterprise. Uh, as for talking about the uh, book called The Testaments, which will appear on September the 10th, 2019, I'm under an embargo from my publishers, and they would kill me if I told you anything about it. <laughs> but they're, but they're going to do a cover reveal very soon. <laughs> Ta-da! The cover <laughs> reveal. This, this, these things are increasingly, books are increasingly published like um, movies. Yeah. Are they not? Mm -hmm. The trailer, the trailer, the yeah, trailer of the book of the movie of the book of the movie. Um, I hesitate to push back against both Margaret Atwood and Emily. Um, well, might you hesitate? Yeah. It's <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've, I've held this in for a couple of days, but I, I want to push back against. I, more against Emily because she's trying to be accurate. You there. can't mm -hmm. push back against yeah. Emily. <laughs> so, she will it, slay you. We, 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 you've she has the it's bow a shame of arguments. Mm -hmm. It's a shame culture. Mm -hmm. It's an honor culture. It's a revenge culture. And the, it's telling, I think, that Telemachus does the killing yep. because yes, he's is. the one who has to worry about the child of that coupling, who mm -hmm. will grow up to revenge his father's death. Sure. Mm -hmm. And so it makes, it's good policy mm -hmm. to off with them. To off the maid so they won't have children. Yeah. Sure, but yeah. that's not the same as justice, and that's not the same as them having done something wrong. And that's yeah, also but, not the same as, and some but, translators have Telemachus call them sluts. It's oh, also not the same as that. I'm and not so the, defending. But let's have I'm some distinctions about, have they, are they criminals in any possible way? No, the text doesn't present them as criminals. I mean, yes, of course, these, both Odysseus and Telemachus have motives, and they have, I think, slightly different oh. motives. And it's to do with both practicality and shame and the attempt to... To, to c claim total ownership over the space, uh, which involves cleaning up both the metaphysical and literal and human kinds of trash. But that's, uh, I mean, I, I, think, I think you're absolutely right that it's both pragmatic and emotional in motivation. But I, I, just want to, I think it's very, very clear in the text that it's not an execution. It's very different from an execution. In execution, you're supposed to have justice on your side. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, well done, Emily. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. you were warned. Okay, so. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> I've just, I have to ask this because I will never stop thinking about this conversation mm -hmm. between Valerie and Margaret about <laughs> power and architecture. And I just need to know, there's just, there's a lot more nuance in power, I think, in my own mind. So I'm like wondering, are you each thinking of power differently? And, or is the lack of architecture, is it, is it a necessary condition for like, you know, removing this power dynamic between individuals? But is, is it in itself sufficient? Or is there some other cultural context okay. that we didn't get in so, this part? Yeah, like here's that. another way of thinking of it. Um, you can have respect within a culture that does not arrange itself in a hierarchy. Um, so, so you don't have a king, right? You don't have nobles, you don't have slaves or any of those people, but you have certain individuals who are respected, and uh, they're respected for their accomplishments. So somebody is a very good hunter, for instance. Uh, somebody is a very fast runner. And if you want to see this in action, you can watch the first Inuit dramatic film that was made, which is called Atanarjuat, The Fast Runner. So he is known for being a very fast runner. Uh, and also a, a very good hunter, and that is a position of respect, but it's other people who accord you the, the respect. They respect you uh, for what you can do. It's not you grabbing the power and insisting on the respect. In fact, if you do that in that culture, people think you're a bad person. Yeah. And in that movie, keep your eyes on the grandmother watch that grandmother uh, and wait until the end of the film because the grandmother is an elder. Again, it's, a, it's something you cannot claim for yourself. Other people decide whether you are that person. Uh, and, and you have a lot of authority, but, but you cannot use it unless you are asked to intervene. So that's another way of, of thinking of it. Yeah, but then at the end of the day, they all go home to the igloo. <laughs> well, no, actually, not in that film they don't, because some of them get exiled. No, I remember that film, and I remember, in fact, that there was some hanky-panky going on between a um, brother and a sister's wife. Or um, well, That's earlier in the film. Yep. At the end happened, of the film. And it happened inside the igloo. It's quite different. <laughs> <laughs> actually, you, you just remember it, because it was a summer hunting cap, so it's happening inside the skin tent. Valerie. Which is a kind of architect. Valerie. <laughs> <laughs> but I think you're right. We are kind of talking about different kinds of power. I mean, so I'm, I'm really thinking power about relationships. Power that you have within yourself. Um, so Emily's power to translate, for instance, that's one kind of power, but power over other people is, I think, what you're talking about when you're talking about political power. And a power over other people in that sense is always dependent upon force. Hmm. Mm -hmm. But not architecture. <laughs> <laughs> if, if you're gonna have a standing army, it is, however, dependent upon agriculture. Woo! I know. I, I don't follow that. Okay, here's, here's how it goes. <laughs> I think uh, should we call a truce on that? And, yeah, and I think there's nope, one nope. more question <laughs> up there. You need a uh, surplus of food. Uh -oh. In the gods. That's what you need. From the gods. Right. Uh, um, I was just wondering, uh, for, I guess this is for all three of you, possibly less for Emily, is uh, given that you are often motivated by sort of giving these small characters a voice. In your own work, are there characters that in retrospect you now feel guilty about uh, having squashed into a minor role? <laughs> uh, and, and yeah, if, if, if any of you would address that, I'd be curious. Va Valerie is devoid of guilty feelings about anything. <laughs> Structures, I suppose. <laughs> that's that's not true. That's not true. No. Okay, sorry. I take it back. What do you? What have you ever felt guilty about? We've known each other for a long time. That's why um, we can go on this way. We're just not being naturally rude to strangers. I, I can. <laughs> yeah. I, it's not so much I felt guilty as that I rethought the way I had um, created a character. You rethought it. Yeah. yeah. Which character? Can you uh, it was me? a character who was. Um, 
I'm trying to remember exactly the situation, but it was a character who was a slave. Um, and the story that I told was a little bit romantic. And years later, I realized, you know, that was, that was dishonest. That's was, the way people want romantic. to think about it. And so that's mm -hmm. one of the reasons why I wrote Property, was guilt about having created this kind of romantic um, lights on the levee, big plantation house, music in the dining room. The slaves weren't singing, but they were not in revolt. Um, and then gradually, the more I read about what slavery was actually like, I realized they all were always in revolt. So I wrote another book. Mm, that's really another interesting. Book. Mm -hmm. I think um, I felt guilty about the many years during which I was reading the Odyssey and not paying proper attention to the, to the characters who weren't Odysseus and Penelope uh -huh. and Telemachus. But I, I was c very conscious in starting my translation that I wanted to remedy some of that, um, the years of teaching the Odyssey the wrong way, the years of mm. perpetuating mm. The, mm. The, con the, the usual traditional ways of sidelining everybody who isn't part of the nuclear family. Mm -hmm. That I, I was actually part of that wrong way of reading it and I wanted to make some reparations about that. Hmm. Hmm. No, I, I have to say something I guilty. feel guilty about. Yeah. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I feel guilty that I never finished my, my uh, doctoral thesis. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> that was the smartest nothing, move you nothing ever made. Really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you it was spent your life good. in academia. Yeah, it was oh about God. supernatural women in 19th century literature. Don't you think the world needed that? Yeah. In, in, in 1962. You can still do it. Yeah. Um, well, I have an unpublished novel. Um, actually, I have three unpublished novels, but two of them never got finished. I don't feel guilty about not finishing them because they weren't going to be any good. Yeah, I have three like that, so too. So I don't feel guilty about that. But should I have ended my first one that never got published with the female central character pushing the male central character off a roof? Sounds should good. I have done that? Do I feel guilty about that? No. I don't. No. <laughs> No, but, but the world is definitely not ready for it in, in 1964. Mm -hmm. And uh, oh, I got true. taken out to lunch by a publisher who said, could I consider changing the ending? And I said, no, I didn't think I could. And he leaned across the table and patted me and said, is there anything we can do? <laughs> <laughs> is there anything we can do to help you with this obviously psychological problem? <laughs> That's great. Which I thought was very kind. <laughs> I think that will have to be the last word on that. <laughs> Thank you all so much for coming. Thank you. <laughs>